Madam President. Senator from Wyoming. Uh, thank you, Madam President. M Madam President, I come to the floor, um, as I do every week, as a physician who's practiced medicine and taken care of families in Wyoming for a quarter of a century, to give a doctor's second opinion of uh, the health care law. And uh, county commissioners from around the state of Wyoming are coming to town today uh, for their annual meeting. It was one year ago today at that annual meeting that uh, Nancy Pelosi, then the Speaker of the House, addressed that group and said, we have to pass the bill so you can find out what's in it. That quote has been replaced and repeated again and again and again, and people now know what is in this health care law. People have found out, and every month since this law has been passed, people have found out an additional thing about the health care law that they absolutely do not like. So now that the American people know what's in the bill, and they know that they don't like it, let's get to the fundamentals of what the American people have asked for. When they asked for change in health care in this country, they said they wanted the care that they need from the doctor that they want at a price they can afford. Well, the new law fails that test, and it fails miserably. It has only taken a year to break, out, to break almost every promise that the President made when he addressed our Congress and we addressed the country. So what I'd like to do is take a look month by month at how those promises were broken. And since it is now March, and it started in March with her statement, in March of 2010, one year ago, the Congressional Budget Office evaluated the law to see how much it actually would cost. They told us that the law could only reduce the deficit if it did something about the long-term insolvency of Medicare. Instead, the Democrats and the President proposed and adopted and signed into law cuts of over $500 billion from Medicare. Not to save Medicare, but to start a whole new government entitlement program. A decision that the CBO said would increase the deficit by $260 billion. Well, let's go to, to April. In April, we learned that the cost for those Medicare cuts go way beyond dollars and cents. An analysis by the Department of Health and Human Services found that these cuts could drive up to 15 percent of hospitals out of business. For this administration, the shortages of hospitals apparently takes a back seat to the shortage of Washington bureaucrats. Now let's go to May. In May, we learned that over 200,000 Americans with pre-existing conditions and expensive health insurance would not be eligible to enroll in the new high-risk pools created in the health care law. That is, of course, unless they were willing to completely drop the insurance that they had and wait without insurance, wait without insurance for six months. Then they would qualify for what was in the health care law. For many people with pre-existing conditions who were paying higher premiums, they felt that that would be irresponsible behavior, risky, put them at financial risk, but that's what this administration and this government was proposing. Well, in June, after the administration sent over four million postcards to small businesses, you remember the postcards, the ones claiming that those small businesses would be eligible for a tax credit? Well, the Associated Press blew the whistle. It turned out that the only small businesses that were eligible, fully eligible for these tax credits, implied fewer than 25 people. So to be eligible at all, they had to have fewer than 25 people. But moreover, the Associated Press reported that the tax credit drops off sharp, sharply if the company employed any more than 10 people, or if the annual salary was averaging more than $25,000. So if you had 10 employees and paid them on average $25,000, you could get the tax credit. But once you went to that 11th employee and gave someone a raise, you started to lose the thing that the administration said was so valuable. That was in June. In July, the Obama administration's own Justice Department confirmed the individual mandate penalty is a tax increase. Well, when ABC News' George Stephanopoulos asked the President if the mandate penalty was a tax increase, this is what the President said, quote, I absolutely reject that notion. Well, if the President absolutely rejects the notion, why is his own Justice Department contradicting him? 
In August, without so much as a hearing before Congress, the President made a recess appointment. He tapped Dr. Donald Berwick to run the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So how big is this federal agency? Well, it includes oversight on a budget larger than the Pentagon's. Dr. Berwick believes the government must ration health care and that the only issue is whether we ration with our eyes wide open, as he said. Well, the, prom the President promised not to ration care. So why did he make an appointment of someone who believes it's inevitable to ration care and do it in a way without ever allowing the Senate, Republicans and Democrats alike, members of this body, to even have a hearing so that this individual could explain his position, explain his previous comments, explain what he said and written. The President refused and did a recess appointment on someone who never testified, never came to a confirmation hearing, and put him in, par in charge of a program with a budget larger than the Pentagon's. I mean, can you imagine if a Secretary of Defense was made a recess appointment without a congressional hearing? It's unthinkable. In September, the administration released new rules estimating that 80 percent of the small businesses would be forced to change the coverage of insurance that they offer to their employees. Madam President, th these aren't my numbers. These are the administration's own numbers. But it was the President who said over and over again that if you like the coverage you have today, then you can keep it. Now we know that was another one of the President's empty promises. Well, in October, responding to complaints from unions and corporations, the Obama administration began handing out waivers, waivers that excuse individual groups from Obamacare's expensive mandates. These waivers went mostly to those politically connected to this administration. Now, most American families still have to bear the law's expensive burdens. Currently, I mean clearly, for this administration, playing favorites is more important than achieving fairness. I think every American ought to be able to get a waiver from this health care law. In November, a majority of the American people voiced their opposition to this law and handed an election response that resulted in a significant change in the composition of the House and the Senate because the American people knew they did not want this health care law. Well, the American people were concerned that they even wondered if this law was constitutional. And in December, a federal judge in Virginia ruled that it was unconstitutional to force Americans to buy a product. The Service Employees International Union, one of the biggest unions in the country, also admitted in December that fulfilling the requirements of Obamacare would be financially impossible. This is the same law that they said the country needed when they lobbied in favor of it. In January of this year, the Medicare actuary called the administration's claim that the health care law would bring down costs, quote, false more than true, close quote. Also, a federal judge in Florida struck down the entire law as unconstitutional. And then in February, last month, we learned that the IRS, when they submitted their 2012 budget to Congress, that that IRS budget specifically mentions the health care law 250 times. They mention it as a source of authority and funding for new powers. They called the health care law, quote, the largest set of tax law changes in more than 20 years. To begin implementing these changes will require thousands of new Washington bureaucrats. Well, that was, that was through February. Now here we are, March 9th. Did anything happen in March that the American people now found out about the law? Absolutely. Last Friday night, the Secretary of Health and Human Services granted another 150 waivers. Another 150 waivers. Now there are over 1,040 waivers covering 2.6 million individuals. These are people who don't want to live under the uh, Obama health care law. They don't want it to apply to them, and I think every American ought to have that right to that same waiver. Well, those, of those 2.6 million who have received waivers, Madam President, 1.2 million are members of unions. So that's 46 percent of the waivers have been given to union members. Now, the website where you go to for that information, of course, 
the, uh, the secretary has tried to disguise how they label these individuals, and union plans are now called multi-employer plans. Oh, and, and under this change of the name, the website where you have to go to to learn this is called Promoting Transparency. So we have an administration says one thing, does another. The American people now know what is in the law. As they were studying the law before the vote, they didn't want it. Now they know, and they still don't want it. It is clear that it is unsustainable, unaffordable, and unconstitutional. It is time to repeal and replace it. Thank you, Madam President. I yield the floor.